so namaste johnson welcome namaste ahimsa conversations and thank you so much for making time um i was wondering if we could begin with your earliest memories maybe from childhood uh how earliest you, memories of, of the concept of non violence oh of the concept of non violence uh, i mean when did you have first heard about it um it was really i mean it was really like like 16 17s when i was reading literatures about activism um i'm kind of a, a political like i interested in politics i interested in social movement i interested in the issues of justice when i was really young when i was in primary school at the age of 10 or 11 um and part of the reason is because there was a huge protest um when i was 11 years old six year after britain hand over uh hong kong to china people were upset about the government who were going to introduce a bill that my restrict freedom of speech and people took to the street and i witnessed that i went to the protest so i became very interested about it um but it was until like i was in high school that i started to read more about social movement or activism and back in back when i was 16 so i'm now 30 and when i was 16 which is you know 14 years ago 15 years ago um there wasn't a, like huge civil disobedience movement uh or like huge protests in hong kong it was a relatively vibrant economic city where people were focusing on their economic life and also you know political issues wise there were protests but not huge one um so most of the literature on activism um, or popular one would be Gandhi would be MLK and of course they are like the picture of non-violence and that's how I get into understanding or introduce the concept of non-violence but I would consider I'm actually a practitioner of non-violence movement much earlier uh, like I-, I remember when I was I think I was six years old um, and then I was in a playground just you know climbing all those ladder and 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 there were like some play things and there were a couple kid and i think one of them is has a i can't say for sure but he has a maybe he has a pakistanian or indian heritage cuz there are like migrants who live in hong kong and you know there are also the police who are living in hong kong for three to four generation um but they constantly uh we see a lot of discriminations from the local chinese too um so when i was in a playground i heard a lot of kid using racial slur um against the uh the, the other uh, uh the, the indian or pakistani kid um so i yell at the the, the chinese kid i i like I told them you shouldn't do it like you know you have no right like something like that um and and it feels empowering um to just stand up for you know someone uh, my memory is is really bad but i can remember like so i don't remember the sequence of the incidents but i remember the feelings of feeling good um <laughs> about like st- voicing out you mean you you felt good standing up for those kids Yeah yeah i guess i like the sense of justice um yes. it's really with me and it it makes me feel good mm. Mm. i i wonder if you could say a bit more about how you found the literature on gandhi and martin luther king was it in the school system yeah yeah there were um there were you know um when i was in high school i was really into history um i'm also you know studying history well history both here were history and chinese history and um there was one series of book that used comic to tell the form of comic to tell well history and um so you know it was you know really for kids at that time and it was really easy to read and is entertaining and one of the series of uh the world history comic book is about gandhi um, so that's how i get you know hook into the literature 
Mm. Mm. Uh, so what were you doing in 2014? What was happening in your life uh, just before you got involved in the umbrella movement? Because I feel that may be, mm. that may help us to understand what drew you into that movement? And, you know, and, because you were part of a group that led the movement. Yeah. So I, yeah, looking back, I wouldn't say we led the movement. It is many of the protest actions is spontaneous. Um, but there were also, you know, 13 months of organizing work, mobilizing the public, setting up the agenda. And uh, I was a student leader and also a spokesperson for a civil society groups alliance, uh, which was uh, called the Civil Human Rights Fund. Um, I was the uh, spokesperson for this alliance and there were more than 50 NGOs and local human rights groups and human rights groups. Uh, it's an intersectional alliance where people would discuss human rights issues gender equality, uh, but also democracy. Um, so um, in 2014, I, I was in my fourth year of universities. I just stepped down from my presidentships of student government at that time. And um, uh, the society at that time has a very long, like more than 13 months long of discussions about universal suffrage and how we can achieve universal suffrage. Uh, because a little bit background about Hong Kong is, uh, even though China do promise uh, universal suffrage and democracy and guarantees of human rights in an international treaty that was signed in 1984 between Britain and, and, and China, uh, the promise was never materialized and people were very frustrated and disappointed about the delay and they also see a uh, gradual deterioration of human rights um, back then. Um, so um, a law professor of, um, of the universities of Hong Kong, Benny Tai, uh, has proposed this idea about civil mass civil disobedience, occupying streets and causing disruptions um, as a way to gain leverage for Hong Kong people to um, achieve universal suffrage. Um, and it's worth noting that before 2014, there wasn't like huge, huge diso uh, civil disobedience action. Like most of the protests before 2014 was one day protest or one day demonstration. There were smaller like Occupy style of protests like the Occupy Central Movement, which is resembling and deprecating the Occupy Wall Street Movement in 2010, but that was an outlier. Um, so as a student leader, like as, as a young activist at that time, of course, we are very excited about the ideas of massive disobedient movement. Like we are motivated by the idea of it. Um, so we started, uh, we, we start participating in the uh, coordination committee of the movement. Um, we organize referendum in different sectors, including the students. We organized deliberation day where hundreds of people or and discuss what is democracy, what is the electoral system do you want to see, uh, what a man's civil disobedience, what's a man's violence. Um, so it was a very good civil um, education, um, but also, you know, civil participation activities and campaign at that time. Mm -hmm. And then it's slowly leading up to the uh, spontaneous protest, the large outbreak of the uh, protest in 2014. So Johnson, was there a difference of uh, opinion inside the protest movement? Were there people perhaps who felt that some violence should be used? And uh, how many people were drawn to the non-violence approach? Because it did manage to go with the non-violence approach. How did that happen? Um, I, I would say in the space of 2014, 
the use of military action um, or violence per se, it's really at, at the fringe side. So most of the people were signing up to the ideas that you know, no militant style confrontation should be used during protests. And um, for the coordination committee of the campaign, uh, they even have this mechanism where people can sign up a, a form and say, you know, they as a participant, they as a protester, they agree with a set of principles on not violence, which, you know, a couple of thousands of people sign up not a lot compared to uh, what has eventually happened, which is more than a million people join the protest and, you know, uh, join the occupation. Uh, but um, this idea that people should use non-violent disruption as the major tactics resonate. And it also takes deep root um, among the protesters where at the first few weeks of um, the umbrella movement, uh, people will hold hand in hands as a human chain when they face police uh, firing uh, pepper spread or using baton to, you know, trying to disperse them. Like people would not fight back. Um, it was after several weeks of violence from both the police and long stay actor, uh, aka Polk government supporter that punch protesters or drag protesters or using you know violence against protesters then some of the protesters in the umbrella movement starting to use relatively higher confrontational tactics i.e building shields for themselves or folding water bottles uh, to police officer who are in riot gear so in a way like in a very strict non-violent sense, like throwing water bottle or, or you know, pushing back uh, a police cordon not using your shield amounts to uh, violence tactic. But if you use it, if you, if you view it in a comparative sense, in a relative sense, no, not, not so much. Um, I, I will say like the, the more militant style of uh, struggle occurred in 2019, um, but not in 2014. Mm. 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 You've written very eloquently about the challenges of nonviolence. You, know, you have described in your articles how the expectations of, for success uh, when they were uh, not uh, fruitful, that this led to frustration and divisions within the movement among the protesters, uh, and that this uh, called for some introspection. So could you elaborate on what were these challenges that you faced and how did you deal with them? Yes. Um, so the expectations on the outcome and the result of uh, social movement tactics, it's really connected to uh, why people take the street, you know, at the first place, right? Protesters or students or professionals or just regular, uh, uh, you know, folks, they don't take to the street because they they feel they need to exercise nonviolent principle. They take the street because there is a certain political outcome they want to achieve, right? So in mass movement, like the umbrella movement or the 2019 protests or the, uh, um, or the, or, or the farmer protests, like people want to see result. People wants, want to see policy change. People want to seek accountability from the authority. And weeks long when they participate into um, the movement, they will start asking themselves, is my actions now effective in bringing the change that I want to see? Is the tactics that are advocated by the leaders of the movement an effective pathway uh, to uh, the change we want to see, right? Um, so there's 
and that's where tensions might occur between some leaders in the movement or leading figures of the movement and ordinary protesters. Um, in, in political science terms, like legitimacy is it's really important for a government, right? And I feel this is all legitimacy is also important in a mass decentralized movement. When you have some leading figures who will act as the agenda setter, who will advocate a certain strategy and tactics, who will also act as a party of negotiations uh, or dialogue with the government. People have expectations to this leading figure. People expect these leading figures will point out a pathway that is effective and able to bring that movement to victory. And when they're staggering or bottleneck in, in the movement, people that the uh, protesters would then think twice or think otherwise. But they might also challenge and have doubt to um, the strategy and tactics that are set by the leading figure. And thus, tension occurred or even challenge of the leaderships occurs. Um, and we see this constantly throughout the last 12 years from Arab Spring to the Umbrella Movement, to the Ukraine Maidan Movement, to the, um, uh, to the farmer protests in India, to 2019 uh, uh, protests, where protesters and ordinary citizens have more tour, aka social medias, uh, connectivities to various resources that allows them to become a leader themselves, that allows them to become a leading figure who can propose alternative strategies and tactics and recruit followers uh, um, uh, during the process. Um, and that's when fashions in the movement occurs too. Uh, sorry, factions. Fashions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do you then, uh, in a sense, uh, cohere? How does the movement then cohere? Any ideas on that? And is the main fault line the issue of violence versus nonviolence? Or were there other, uh, uh, it, it, because that may not be the central issue. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I, I don't see the, preference of violences of non fallacy in an absolute contradictions. I see it as a tensions between people perception in what constitutes effective in bringing the change they want to see. Mm -hmm. So the angle is kind of the same, but the pathway is um, different. And that differences cause uh, sometimes mocking each other or e even demeaning uh, to each others. Um, so I'm not saying this tension is it do not need to be resolved, but as organizers or just ordinary protesters, we should approach this tensions with more vigilancies and with humbleness. Um, it's really easy. I, I mean, it's kind of like a human nature that we, we want to seek the perfect solution, like the silver bullet for everything, right? Just point me, like, I'm going to just give me a number of the stock and it will rise to, you know, it, it, will, it will rise to, it will skyrocket. Like, just give me this 30, just, just give me this 30 second solution statement and I will follow it. I, I will sign these petitions and it will topple a, a government, right? Um, we, are, we are educated in a way to, to try to find the perfect solutions, but in a mass movement, different tactics and strategies comprehend with each other. Now, of course, sometimes they actually sabotage with, with each other, but a lot of tactics, the diversity of tactics, mm. it's in principle comprehending with each other. When we look at uh, like the 1950s or 60s, 
where nonviolent movement seems to be pure or the most dominant transitions in the movement. That's not true. Like even MLK has a absolutely dominant positions in maintaining nonviolence disciplines. There are still Black Panthers. There are like students groups that are more militant, that are using more you know, radical tactics in combating the police and also uh, uh, right supremacists. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the case of South, South Africa as well, like Mandela was leading a military front um, before he goes to jail for, you know, 30 years. Um, so acknowledging these tensions and complexities um, is something that I feel it's really important um, when we design uh, on strategy. And second, one thing that can help us to build consensus or, you know, to cohere in the, 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 the movement is you need to identify a, a goal. You have to, you, you have to uh, build a consensus on the end goal, the end games that, that people want to see. Um, and in the case of 2014, it was uh, during the Umbrella Movement, it was uh, pretty unified about the goal, which is universal suffrage yeah. in 2019 protest. Um, spontaneous act of protesters has uh, a five point consensus of the movement. Uh, and, and no matter what choice of tactics people want to use, they often refer back to the five-point consensus. They, they often uh, refer back to the five-point demand okay. um, and, 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 and work to, that, to the five-point demand uh, in the 2019 protest. Uh, it was about uh, withdrawing the controversial legislation proposed by the government, which will allow the government to send fugitives or suspects to mainland China for trials, which is a completely different jurisdiction um, from Hong Kong. Um, and there's the demand about retracting uh, the categorizations of riot. Because um, at that time, like during the uh, protest, like the government say the protest was a riot and a riot charge can get people maximally a 10 years of imprisonment. Um, so people are really worried about um, the people who were arrested. Uh, and the third demand is about releasing the protesters who were participating in the protest. Um, and then there is also a demand about holding the police brutality accountable. Um, there was excessive use of tear gas and uh, rubber bullet and all kinds of, you know, uh, riot gear by the police. And they were attacking journalists and uh, children and, and protesters indiscriminately. And people were very angry about them and thus demand a independent inquiry that can help the police brutality accountable and lastly universal suffrage uh, which people see as the root of the police brutality and also the deteriorating civil liberties um, in the past 20 years. Um, of course uh, all those five demands were not heard or compromised by the government uh, instead of making peace with the citizens, um, the Chinese government and the Hong Kong government has actually tightened their civil, uh, civil liberties in Hong Kong uh, by imposing a national security law um, and also arresting arrest um, and detain most of the opposition figures. Um, but that was later than uh, uh, 2019. Um, and it it is also uh, what is happening in Hong Kong right now is a manifestation of the shrinking civic space elsewhere, like in India or in Philippines or in Myanmar. Um, I mean, there are more attacks to foreign NGOs. Uh, we expect like foreign NGO law, the one that are uh, also an actor in India, introduced in the next two years. Um, more people are categorized as terrorists. <laughs> so similar to, um, yeah, authoritarian governments elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. 
you have uh, also talked about the dangers of a last stand approach and that in many protest movements, uh, particularly where nonviolence is the principle that is driving or guiding people, there can be a tendency to say this is the end game. And I think if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, you have referred to you know trying to learn from Gandhi about how uh, to balance, in a sense, a restlessness with the patience. So I'm very keen to hear you uh, elaborate on that. What is what are the challenges of this, and uh, how do you keep the energy up and yet not fall into a kind of a last stand battle which will demoralize? Yeah, I'm really trying hard. Like keeping energy high, it's um very difficult. Um, and and for the last last stand strategy, right? Um, it is referring to a mental status. Uh, in a mass contentious movement, right? When people heard about police brutality, like police beating children and firing a uh, uh, rubber bullet and blind people and injured people like potential even like casualties um, it makes people emotional uh, and it makes people either want to withdraw from the news or they become very agitated there's outrage there's anger there's huge grievances which makes people wants to um, stop the action immediately and also again find the perfect solutions to end it uh, to end the the act of violence is uh, immediately it maybe and, oh, some people also want to hit back perhaps yeah want to hit back like um it, it, it again it's a, it's a very natural response right if you're hitting by a person you either flee or you fight um i i personally has a lot of internal con uh, contra contradictions or con uh, conflict about that too. Like, because I was punched by police. Like, I was angry about it. Um, and when I see the police could injure protesters with impunity, I imagine in my head about, you know, how to hurt the police how to like make petrol bomb, uh, you know, how to, you know, arm yourself so that you can fight back. Um, so it's a very natural response for people to want to eliminate the perpetrators of violence immediately and putting in, putting these emotions uh, and mental state into the movement. It, partially explains why many people uh, after sustaining cycles of violence would want to take arms and respond violently. Um, and, and also and on top of that, people also feel the urgency is that if they don't respond swiftly, they will be killed or removed or we become irrelevant, um, unable to save those they love and care. Um, and, and again, those are the emotions that makes people want to respond violently. Um, so learning from Gandhi and learning from nonviolence like movement, I think one very important element is what we do, the choice of our strategy and tactics, is actually prefiguring the societies in the future. Now, in Gandhi writings, like where he's coming from about nonviolence is, is leaning to spiritual, leaning to relatively religious, that there is a very strong belief in him and also his follower that life is precious and the society should be configured in a way that 
rise on the non-violence uh, principle that you know people if you know, people should interact non-violently that people should not eliminate the existences of each others. As for MLK, uh, he is more leaning on the strategic strategic non-violence side where he sees non-violence as an effective way in moving people who are neutral, that people who are in the middle and supporting the movement. And he sees sometimes that violence he would, would be counterproductive in gaining popular support. Um, I, I, I take all this you know, two leaning into account. Um, and I, I, I think like we, are, we should also agree that the choice we make during a mass movement would become the foundations of social interactions in the near future. So just put it in plain words. If you choose to end a war with massacre or ethnic cleansing, which a lot of people do, especially when you know the, the, the perpetrator is a mighty you know, country, then it's more likely that in the futures, um, when there's disagreement between the citizens, they will also use massacres or mass killing or you know, really brutal uh, campaign against each other because the history tells them and convince them what, 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 what was done. Like what, that, that people can actually go to the like, very bottom of the bottom line. That since there are already precedents, we can ride on the precedents, we can duplicate their precedents. Um, so as someone that feels like, I feel very strongly that we need to escape from the cycle of violences. Cycle of? Uh, uh, the cycle of violence. Yes. Yeah. Um, that I believe out there, there's a better version of doing politics without coercing other, without marginalizing uh, people, without using in disciplining people. And I think, although like, I'm not like, I'm not a pure nonviolent practitioner, like, but I try to um, do as much as I can and, and always think about alternatives uh, of violence. That's beautiful. Um, you know, what you said, of course, when we are having this conversation today, uh, when all, I think one part of our mind is uh, on Ukraine and the enormous and completely avoidable suffering that uh, has been unleashed there, um, so many people do ask us, all of us who are in some way or the other, either advocates of nonviolence or are uh, keen to see it grow in some form. You know, we are asked, what is the use of nonviolence? See, uh, this is happening. And how can nonviolence help the Ukrainians at this moment? Um, so would you want to take a shot at that? How would you answer that? Let's try. Um, it's very hard. I mean... <laughs> It is it is In, international theory, like supporting Ukraine or even military, what falls into the category of just war theory. Like the war, if you support Ukraine right now, military, it will be just like by most of the academics, by most of the international relation um, um, uh, uh, scholars. Um, so non-violency doesn't mean refrain from any uh, use of force, but we have to use force justly and also in a proportional manner. Nonviolence doesn't mean refrain from the use of force entirely, right? If you see a kid is beaten by a soldiers, of course you have to stop them like by pushing the, the, the soldier, by a behanding the soldiers or even have to use a greater use of force. The principle of nonviolence here, however, 
is a reminder you should not use excessive force, that our response to violence is, should always be proportional to the force that we receive, and also to, uh, to seek alternatives and seek pathway that can reduce further confrontations and conflict. And, and I, I feel like, like although like I, I support Ukraine, I stand with Ukraine, I, 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 I'm think, like, I have friends that are, that are right in Kiev right now, you know, who is fighting. Um, and as nonviolent practitioner, even though we are not like holding arms, we could not because we are not in Ukraine. We are not at the front line. There's so much we can do. One being reduce the will to fight among the Russian side. Communicating with Russia, supporting the anti-war protesters that has put their body at the front line in St. Petersburg and also in Moscow, denouncing their leader or co-and-co-leader leader, um, to go to war. Um, I, I seen this very great example and it, this is a very good inspiration for me in, in Myanmar case, right? Like Myanmar has been a country that is suffer like that, that has suffered from brutal, brutal campaign, like massacre, ethics cleansing. And in the past year, like more than a thousand and nine hundred people were killed and there was millions of, uh, internal displaced people because of the attempt at coup. The shadow governments and the resistance camp responds by fighting back. But not only they take arms to fight back and kill the, uh, the, the soldiers of the, uh, of the military junta, they were also trying to convince um, soldiers of the junta to defect from the camp. And they were successful in getting thousands of soldiers defect from the camp. They even get high when uh, of uh, uh, military officials, lieutenant colonel, um, to defect from the camp. What they did is they organized seminar, like anonymous seminars, telling how soldiers could defect. Like they were offering uh, material supports, like donations and medical support, pathway to escape for the soldiers to defend, to drop arms. And I feel, although the use of force is the, is, is, is the, is the mainstream news, right? It's, it's on the news. It has become utterly important for non-violence practitioners and anti-war uh, protesters to trying to deter and convince those who are acting violently to drop arms. And in the Ukraine case, we need to convince the, the, the Russian soldiers to defect because it's not a war they should fight. Like they should not die for a dictator who is hiding thousands of miles from the front line, hiding in a bunker. It's unnecessary. Indeed, indeed. I found it very heartening how, you know, you, for example, written about uh, sympathizing with the Chinese citizens uh, yeah. because, and, and seeking common cause with them. Uh, yeah, it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very hard. Like, it takes a lot of mental toll yeah. um, to try to find common ground with people who you've seen as adversaries. And I still have a lot of internal conflict. Like, I, I would not consider myself as a nationalist. Like, I don't have much interest in, you know, nationalism because I believe we have our identity is actually much diverse than just being a citizen of a nation. Uh, and, and under the umbrella of nationalism there, there's, there can also be a lot of exploitation and marginalizations of different groups of people as well. Um, but reaching out to Chinese citizens, it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, one being our information space is in silo. 
uh, like there's great firewall in China and most of the mainland Chinese just and they, they were receiving a lot of propaganda. Um, they were also seeing things that VM falls uh, the officials narrative, right? I'm not saying like people were brainwashed by propaganda at all, but in a in a silo in an isolated information space, it's 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 really easy uh, that the official narratives pervade. Uh, so it makes me feel torn apart, and it makes me feel sad when I see comment from mainland uh, like netizen. Uh, shaming and laughing and demeaning the the democracy struggles in Hong Kong, yeah. just calling us as agents of the CIA, calling us as the uh, as the puppet of the U.S. government and imperialism. Because I know from my experience that that's not the case. Yeah. Um, but I also see that if we don't try to reach out. Sooner or later, the struggle between freedom and dictatorships would transcend into ethnic conflict, where mainland Chinese might despise like Hong Kong people, and Hong Kong people despise them, and there will be a lot of conflict. There will be a lot of violence. There will be brutal campaign against each other, like other countries do. And I want to do my part to try to avoid that. Yeah. And actually, uh, nonviolence is, in a sense, the ideal uh, binding energy, isn't it? Because uh, it's a universal truth that nobody wants to suffer, either emotionally or physically. Uh, so that uh, should be, I, I imagine. But again, as you say, uh, it's very difficult to know how your struggles are presented or are, are you know, portrayed. Um, you've also spoken about the importance of celebrating success. How, to what extent has that been a feature? Because see, the amazing thing is that eight years down the line from the umbrella movement, the struggle in Hong Kong continues. I mean, it may have ups and downs and it may have, you know, more active periods and uh, some lulls in between, but it is still there. So in what ways has celebrating success been important? It, it makes you, it, it makes you more resilient to uh, burnout. It also makes you resilient to, uh, 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 to, to being cynical. Like, um, like compared to 2019 or compared to P 2019 era, like Hong Kong right now is not in good shape at all. Um, the civic space is so small that like I want to go to a protest. I want to organize a protest to support Ukraine, but I couldn't because there is like huge penalty like to, to citizens who, who We'll take to the street like we can't even have gatherings of over two people <laughs> as a social distancing rule which is political political size and manipulated by the government um so in a way like what we, we can do compared to what we could done like um in 2019 it's really small and it seems there's nothing to celebrate like it's we are losing um, but I also like tell myself that you know, despite the difficulties that the bottleneck, the barriers place on us, like we are, we still have faith to you know to each other, still stand up for our fellow activists. We care each other, well being and emotions. Um, we gather together to learn about Ukraine, to learn about India, to learn about what's outside uh, our horizon and try to be supportive on, on, on social media. And I, I think like the uh, kind of like the human potentials or the, uh, the aspirations to freedom is even more shining in difficult time like now that 
we were not like if it validated that activists or people who pursue freedoms are not participating because it is a trendy thing because it is something with esteem it it validated um that the people who uh who are activists who who who, who pursue freedom are true believers that they live up the values that we 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 often weeks on books or, or history um and i think this is something that we we need, need to celebrate um and if we are always facet to this goal or objective that is like very high up in the skies, we will always feel ourselves. Uh, we will always feel better of ourselves. We will feel, oh, you're too lazy. Like you're not doing like 20 hours a day um, to write stories, to trying to campaign and you're useless um, that, you know, after months of campaigns, you still haven't made any progress. And I, I, I think this kind of emotions then would slowly erode the will of the people. It would make people burn out and it would not be helpful for, 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 for the uh, struggle for human rights. Yeah. Um, and naming the victory, like, will also help your friends and family members because you are also validating them. Like when I talk with my friends about the difficulty I have and they're trying to validate me like by saying that, you know, I'm a caring person, that I have already done a lot, like I burst into tears and, and I feel relief after I burst into tears because I know like, Although I might not be able to achieve like a major milestone, my hard work and my effort is seen by the others. And that keeps me going. That keeps the others going. Beautiful. So Johnson, what are you doing these days? What are, where are you located work-wise? I'm still in Hong Kong. Um, and so... Like professional wise, I'm a labor rights campaigner uh, in the garment sector. So I support workers around the world in the garment industry, women mostly, um, for their worker struggles and also trying to lobby and advocate better policy, better workplace practice, uh, better purchasing practice from global brands. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been campaigning for um, political prisoners in Hong Kong. There are a lot of them and have been supporting friends in Myanmar who uh, are devastated by the military campaign. Um, so keeping myself busy, but at the same time, um, trying to learn new things like doing rock climbing. Uh, we, we have to stop it temporarily because of the social distancing rules. Um, trying to do more yoga, um, weak books that are non-politics. Uh, like just with like fiction like yeah i feel like my world somehow has become very narrow and facaded like and and although it makes me very in-depth into you know how politics works and how social movement works it sometimes also makes me dis detach from 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 the others worlds and you know as an activist you need to understand one thing and and I, I'm very thankful that my partner keep remind me this that like activists consist a very small segment in the society. Our messaging, our jargon don't resonate the others. So if you want to gain popular support, if you want to convince more people into your movement, you need to put yourself in other shoes and also learn about how their world we works so that you can way a effective communication channel um so i'm trying to do that brilliant that's really very insightful and uh, i'm sure that that is a huge source of the strength that you have that's obvious that you know i can see it glowing on on your face so in closing johnson any um any tips, any advice you would give to young people who like yourself across the world are engaged in the same struggle 
for dignity and uh, the right to life and freedom, uh, what inner strengths can they cultivate? What insights would you, in, a, in, you know, in summarizing, because you, you mm. have a lot of experience to draw on. Mm. So what yeah, are, I, I, yeah, oh, what sorry. advice oh. would you give them? No, no, no. Just what advice would you give them for what they can cultivate as strengths that will enable them to be resilient and continue the long struggle? Yeah, so celebrating small victory is my number one because it makes you more sustainable. All right, we are fighting for a sustainable world, climate wise or you know, economic wise. We also need to uh, make, make ourselves sustainable by validating each other. Um, secondly, um, I also had a lot of wrong path uh, in my activism. Uh, like when I was young, I, when I was younger, I was more antagonist to uh, opposing fashions in the movement. Like people who, are, who have the same goal, but you know, who have a very different pathway, um, and there were a lot of internal argument, like toxic debate and demeaning. Uh, I wish I didn't do it because, uh, you know, it's really harmful um, in, a bo- in both movement sense and also in a personal sense. Uh, so we don't need to antagonize, use antagonizing uh, uh, to, 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 to people who we don't see eye to eye. We, we just need to get to the point, like, for say on the truth, for say on the fact, uh, and also point out the tensions, you know, when you can, like, um, um, and, and the fact thing is, um, and this is particular truth in a mass movement. Um, in a mass movement, you're joined, the, the mass movement is joined by people from all walks of life. And Mass movement, although sometimes are alternative to the official narratives or to the hegemony, um, people are also social animals that inherit some hegemonic element. For instance, misogyny, patriarchal, uh, pa- uh, 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 patriarchal, um, and you know, t- toxic arguments. Right, we inherit that. And we bring it into the movement. Um, what I've seen in, in the past 10 years in the movement is sometimes people really get hurt by marginalizations within the movement, be it misogyny, be it homophobic. Um, there are like people could be supportive to democracy, but at the same time homophobic, right? You, you've seen that like, and, and, and also like, in, in examples of, of 2019 protests, like you were seeing supporters of democracy, but at the same time, they're supporters of Trump's. Um, and so as an activist, we really need to keep reflecting about our approach, our messaging, our narrative, and also to challenge our own belief, right? It's really easy for our activists to feel, okay, I am for the justice, Thus, I'm right. Like everything I do is right. Um, and I, I, I want to post this like very challenging missions to all um, activists, including myself, that you need to reflect on, on your approach all the times. Otherwise, um, it, it, you, you might be surprised at how close a, a leading figures of a, of a protest movement is uh, to a dictator's where, you know, <laughs> leading figures of, of this move can, can also very dictatorial, can, can also be very like misogynist and all, all that. Um, so don't be the people you hate by reflecting yourself, but also pointing the tensions and pointing uh, what's one you see within the movement, because that's, we that's it that what really helps our movement evolve to um and, and configure our society to be more equitable fair and inclusive thank you so much and god bless you and more power to you, you too